again, now we are on part B of chapter four, um, covering the tissues. So we talked about in part A, epithelial tissues and glands. Now we're on connective tissues, and it's abbreviated CT. Connective tissue is the most abundant and widely distributed of those four primary tissue types. Remember we had epithelial tissues, connective tissues, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So there are a lot of different types of connective tissues. There's actually four major classes, connective tissue proper, um, and this group has several of them. And then we have cartilage, there's three types of cartilage actually. There's also bone and blood, which people might not think of really as connective tissue if you just hear the term. Overall, the major functions of connective tissue include binding and support, protection, insulation, that one had actually belonged to adipose tissue, and a fuel reserve, it's also adipose tissue, and also transporting substances. So major functions of all the connective tissues are found right here. Characteristics, remember a characteristic is something, it's a shared uh, trait. Um, in a group. So either all or most connective tissues um, share that characteristic. Um, first of all, um, they, are, they come from mesenchyme. I'm not sure if you can really call this a, a characteristic, but um, a mesenchyme is the embryonic tissue of origin from which um, connective tissues um, arise. They have varying degrees of vascularity, which I would argue that's not really a characteristic because by definition, they vary in their amount of um, um, blood supply. However, they all have, or most, have an abundance of extracellular matrix. And we're gonna be talking about what that means. That is a definite characteristic because all or most of the connective tissues have lots of this extracellular matrix. So, there are three structural elements to connective tissues. There is the ground substance and organic fibers. These are actually uh, materials that are produced and secreted by cells themselves. And this forms that um, matrix that, that is around the cells. And then, of course, you have your cells. And this composition is going to vary widely among different types of connective tissues. So this ground substance it's actually very unstructured. It fills the space between the cells. Solutes can diffuse between the blood capillaries and the living cells through it. What is it made out of? Um, this ground substance has interstitial fluid. That means fluid between the cells that are embedded within this substance. Cell adhesion proteins and what we call proteoglycans. So there's cell products, proteins, and fluid, and other types of things that, that are found in this ground substance. And this surrounds the cells of that tissue. And actually, there's three major types of connective tissue fibers. These are protein fibers, or fibrous proteins. And these provide support. The three types are collagen, elastin, and reticulin, so three different kinds of protein fibers. And this is showing kind of a, uh, an example, not really an example, but a figure that would be a prototype um, of a connective tissue. And it would be a connective tissue proper because this is actually providing connection and support for the body structures around it. This one is, is representing a collagen fiber, relatively thick. You can see an elastic fiber, which is more stretchy or elastic, and then a reticular fiber, which is a very thin fiber. It's made of reticulin, which is a protein. Um, and, so, and you also see some cells. So here you see macrophages, which is a white blood cell, which actually can be found in all over the body. They're like little soldiers that are sent out to monitor the situation. And if there, an infection sets in or a foreign invader comes 
on the scene locally, this macrophage will react and begin to fight that uh, infection. Or some foreign tissue, it will respond to that. This is showing you a fibroblast. There's a lymphocyte here, a type of white blood cell. There's fat cells, mast cells, which are related to inflammation, a neutrophil, which is another type of a white blood cell, and you can see a capillary right in here. So what are the, what are the cell types that we find? A blast cell, that, that blast, which would be a suffix found at the end of a word, it indicates a mature an immature form of a cell. Fibroblasts. So this would be a connective tissue cell that forms fibers actually. We find fibroblasts in many of the connective tissues. A chondroblast, chondro, C-H-O-N-D-R-O, means cartilage. So a chondroblast is found in cartilage. Then we have osteo. Who can tell me what osteo means? Yes, it means bone. So an osteoblast is an early bone forming cell. And then there's hematopoietic stem cells. Um, th these will be found um, in blood, actually in the bone marrow where we find the uh, blood cells being formed. So these are the early or immature forms of cells. Then when we see this uh, suffix site at the end of a term of a word, Site is a, referring to a mature cell. These mature cells maintain the matrix. An example would be a chondrocyte. So again, cartilage, um, a cartilage cell would be a chondrocyte. A bone cell is an osteocyte. Other types of cells that we find in connective tissues include fat cells, uh, which is interspersed throughout the body. White blood cells, which are there to fight infection, um, mast cells, they're related to inflammation, and then macrophages, which are, are also a type of white blood cell oh, that have been specialized, actually. This literally means big eaters, and they will engage in, um, uh, they're actually engulfing uh, foreign invaders or some kind of foreign tissue and then destroying it. Phagocytosis is that term for that. Okay, connective tissue proper. This would be all the connective tissues except bone, cartilage, and blood. So these three types are kind of outliers. They do not form a, like a connection and support for body structures. There's actually, among connective tissue proper, we have subclasses. Loose connective tissue includes areolar connective tissue, adipose tissue, which is fat, body fat, um, reticular connective tissue, which is typically found in the lymphatic system, like in lymph nodes, etc. Then there's dense connective tissue. There's dense regular connective tissue. This forms ligaments and tendons. We'll be looking at that again. And then there's dense irregular, um, and that uh, the, the, here the fibers are not um, in parallel, they're actually kind of more basket shape. We'll be looking at that. Um, it's actually our dermis is made of these, this type of connective tissue. And then there's elastic uh, connective tissue. We'll go through each of these. Okay, so areolar connective tissue. This is a very fine um, tissue that will support and bind other tissues together. It's considered the universal packing material between tissues, so it's like the packing peanuts. Um, it's the most widely distributed connective tissue, and when it gets when there's inflammation in an area, it, fluid can actually build up here um, because the capillaries that are serving that area become actually leaky to water, and that will cause edema, and that's the tissue swelling. This is showing you areolar uh, connective tissue. It looks like this. There's a gel-like matrix with all three fiber types. The cells would include fibroblasts. Fibroblasts make the fibers, macrophages, mast cells, and some white blood cells. What does it do? It wraps and cushions the organs, and its macrophages there will phagocytize bacteria. 
Um, also, uh, they play a role in inflammation. Um, and actually, this tissue will hold and convey tissue fluid. Um, so it's found widely distributed um, beneath the epithelia of the body. And it actually also forms that lamina propria, if you'll remember that from be uh, when we talked about epithelial tissues. Um, the lamina propria actually is on the, the deepest side of, a, of an epithelium uh, where the epithelial uh, tissue is connected to the underlying connective tissue. And that lamina propria is actually areolar connective tissue. It packages the organs and surrounds and supports capillaries. Adipose tissue. There's most adipose tissue is, is called white fat. Um, the cells are adipocytes, and what do they do? They fill up with fat. Um, remember, fat is also called a lipid. Um, it's water repellent, um, and it's a long-term energy storage. It provides insulation and protection to body structures. Brown fat, which is um, you know found in the newborn, it actually can use those lipid fuels to heat the bloodstream. Um, not necessarily to produce ATP energy, although white fat is there as our energy storage so that we can um, have ATP production to meet the energy needs of the body. But brown fat's a little bit different. It's actually there to heat the bloodstream, um, particularly in a newborn, is, is very um, vulnerable to changes in temperature because it's been inside its mom in a controlled uh, environment for for long and it has to adapt to the outside world. So this is showing you um, adipose tissue and these look empty. These are adipocytes or fat cells. They're totally filled with fat and that's why they um, look so plump and it looks white because the stain that we use is a water-based stain and lipids or fat repels water. So this is all just fat. The nucleus is over here. It's pushed over to the side because this is filled with fat. So the matrix um, is, is a, uh, and as areolar tissue, but it's actually outside of the cells. There's not a lot of it. So the matrix is out here. Um, most of the material that we have in adipose tissue would be filling up inside the cells, and that would be the fat. What does it do? It provides reserve food or fuel, it insulates against heat loss, and it supports and protects your internal organs. It's also found under the skin and subcutaneous tissue, around your kidneys and your eyeballs. Um, if you think about it, your eyeballs are enclosed in a bony socket, and if you're jumping around, you don't want your eyeballs to bang into the bony socket, so they have fat pads around them. Also, it's found in the breasts and the abdomen. And actually, females have a greater proportion of their adipose tissue right under the skin and subcutaneous tissue than males do. Um, if a male begins to put on extra adipose tissue, it's more likely that they will put it on in the abdominal area, whereas females is more typically um, in the thighs, below the waist. Okay, reticular connective tissue. This resembles areolar connective tissue, but the fibers are reticular fibers or reticulin, R-E-T-I-C-U-L-I-N. And so we also call them reticular fibers. Um, the fibroblasts here are actually reticular cells and what does reticular connective tissue do? It supports free blood cells in the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the bone marrow. And this is showing you reticular connective tissue in lab. When we look at these um, prepared slides, it always kind of reminded me of a granite. Um, if you have a shined up piece of granite, sometimes that forms uh, tombstones or a building, a decorative touch to a building. It looks like um, there's black little lines in it and then like pink or purple dots all around. So reticular connective uh, tissue has a network of reticular fibers, which are right here, these black fibers, um, and they are in a loose ground substance. The reticular cells lie in the network and actually there are many lymphocytes in here. 
And remember, this forms the lymph nodes, the spleen, and bone marrow, and that's where we find a lot of lymphocytes. Um, other cell types would be white uh, mast cells and macrophages. So again, where do we find it? Lymphoid organs, the lymph nodes, bone marrow, and spleen, and there's a little drawing of the spleen. Dense, regular connective tissue. Um, these would be closely packed bundles of collagen fibers. They're parallel to the direction of pull. They have great resistance to pulling. They're slightly wavy and stretchy. Um, they have fibroblasts here that manufacture the fibers and the ground substance. There are very few cells here. It actually does have a very poor blood supply, and this is what forms your tendons and ligaments. Remember, tendons will join muscles to bone, and ligaments join bone to bone at the joints. And here's a picture. Um, you can see there's very few cells. You don't see cells with nuclei in here because really it's these parallel collagen fibers, maybe a few elastic fibers depending on the location. Um, the cell type here would be the fibroblast and its main job is to produce and secrete these fibers. Um, again, it attaches muscles to bones or to muscles. Um, it attaches bones to bones, and it withstands great tensile stress when the pulling force is applied. And this is showing you tendons, most ligaments, and aponeuroses. That's actually like a sheet of a tendon. Um, sometimes we call it fascia. You may have heard F-A-S-C-I-A -S is fascia, which is like a, a sheet, a like tendon-like sheet covering the surface of a muscle, which we will see when we dissect the muscular system. Dense irregular connective tissue. This has the same elements as dense regular connective tissue, but the collagen fibers are thicker and they're irregularly arranged. And I always think of like a basket weave. And so this will resist tension from many directions. And again, we find this in the dermis, just deep to the epidermis. Um, it, it forms your fibrous joint capsules and it forms fibrous coverings of some organs. So some of the uh, aponeuroses are actually dense, irregular, considered irregular connective tissue, just depending on the orientation of these collagen fibers. And this is a picture, it's, we don't have an example like this in lab. It, looks like they use a different type of a stain here, but it's showing you that there's irregularly arranged collagen fibers. There are some elastic fibers here. The major cell type is a fibroblast, and it withstands tension from many directions and it provides structural strength. Uh, here's a fibrous capsule um, around a joint. There's the dermis. Submucosa of the digestive tract is also um, formed with dense irregular connective tissue. Okay, elastic connective tissue. It's very similar to dense regular connective tissue. It's, it's very tough, but it has a much more, uh, it has much more elasticity. It's much stretchier. And we find elastic connective tissue, particularly um, the example here would be the walls of the large arteries. You can see the arch of the aorta here. Um, and this needs to be able to stretch because when the left ventricle contracts a volume of blood into here, you hope that you better hope that this is going to be a little stretchy to be able to accommodate, a, you know, a volume of blood. So um, this elastic connective tissue, um, this is showing you in the wall of the aorta. Um, it's also found in other large arteries within certain ligaments associated with the vertebral column and also within the walls of the bronchial tubes. Cartilage, okay? Cartilage is different than the, the ones that we discussed before. It's a distinct type of connective tissue, and there's three types of cartilage. Um, the cells here are chondroblasts and chondrocytes. Cartilage is tough yet flexible. It lacks nerve fibers. It's about 80% water, so it can rebound after compression. It's avascular, meaning poor blood supply. 
So just like dense, regular connective tissue, tendons and ligaments, cartilage also has, doesn't have a good blood supply, which is also why when it's damaged, it's not going to heal as quickly as a bone fracture, for example. If you have a torn tendon or ligament or torn cartilage, it's going to be more difficult to heal due to the fact that it has um, no blood supply. Here are your three types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, and fibrocartilage. This is showing you hyaline cartilage, and we studied this in the lab as well, so we've got overlap between these tissues um, with our lab activities and also in lecture. Amorphous, meaning there's not a lot of distinct shape to this um, material, this matrix. Um, it's firm. There are collagen fibers that form an imperceptible network. You don't really see a lot of fibers here. But the chondroblasts, the early cartilage cells, are going to be producing that matrix. And then when they mature into chondrocytes, chondros live in a little cradle, actually. Literally, lacuna means a cradle. It's a little space in which the car uh, cartilage cell or chondrocyte lives and it's separated from from the matrix and so it's inside these little lacunae. Lacuna is singular and when you add an E it becomes plural. The function of hyaline cartilage, it provides support and reinforcement. It serves as a resilient cushion and it resists compressive stress. Um, it forms most of the embryonic skeleton in fact and it and then that embryonic skeleton gradually will be ossified or turned into bone. Um, hyaline cartilage covers the ends of long bones in the joint cavities. It forms the costal cartilages of the ribs. Um, it forms the cartilages of the nose, the trachea, and the larynx. Remember the larynx is your voice box. Elastic cartilage is similar to hyaline cartilage, but there's more elastic fibers in the matrix. You can kind of see these elastic fibers here. Um, often the, there, there are chondrocytes, because again, this is another type of cartilage, and the chondrocyte lives in its little lacuna. These often look larger than the chondrocytes in hyaline cartilage, and um, it, it's very sparse matrix around here, but you can really see some of these elastic fibers. What is elastic cartilage for? It maintains the shape of a structure while allowing great flexibility. And it, um, where, where are some examples? Um, it's, it forms that upper ear, the pinna, and it also forms the epiglottis, which is a cartilage flap that when you swallow, it will cover the, the airway um, so that food and fluid will go down the esophagus. And this is fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage is interesting. Um, it has a matrix that's similar to, but less firm than hyaline cartilage. There's very thick collagen fibers here. Um, its function is to provide tensile strength that allows um, it to absorb compressive shock. And it, if you think of with the vertebral column, these little intervertebral discs here are formed with fibrocartilage, and they are good at shock absorption. So you can jump up and down, and if you have uh, normal um, intervertebral discs, it will prevent damage to the bony structures, these um, vertebrae. Um, we also find the discs of the knee joint, um, the menisci, um, that are formed also with fibrocartilage. Uh, also, the pubic symphysis, which is a little cartilage pad right between the left and right pubic bones in the um, pelvic girdle. So this is showing you fibrocartilage of an intervertebral disc. Uh, often, um, this is a different kind of a stain. Our stain looks a little bit more purple in, in the lab uh, with the examples that we look at. And I like to focus on the area where you can actually see little um, columns of chondrocytes in their lacunae. Remember, it's still a cartilage. And these chondrocyte cartilage cells are also in little spaces we call lacunae. And they often form little, like, uh, they look like little bubbles in a row um, or a stack of coins going sideways. 
bone is osseous tissue. There's more collagen than cartilage um, has. And the collagen fibers are interspersed with inorganic calcium salts. And that's, that's what makes bone bone hard. Osteoblasts produce the bony matrix and osteocytes will maintain it. Um, by the way, osteocytes also live in lacuna. So the lacuna is the space in which the cells live in both cartilage and bone. But in bone, of course, the cells are called osteocytes. When compact bone is formed, it actually forms these uh, structures called osteons, and we're going to be looking at that uh, soon. Bone is richly vascularized. It has a great blood supply. And this is showing bone. Um, so this is a hard calcified matrix um, containing many collagen fibers. Uh, the osteocytes are lying within little lacunae, their spaces. It's got a great blood supply. What does bone do? It supports and protects. Um, it provides levers for the muscles to act on. It stores calcium. Primarily, these calcium salts are calcium phosphate. Um, and other minerals are also stored here. There's fat that is stored in the yellow marrow of bones. And in the red marrow, that is where blood cells are formed. And the term for that is hematopoiesis. I really like that word. Hematopoiesis. OK, blood. You wouldn't normally think of blood as a connective tissue, but it is. It's atypical in that the matrix is a fluid. The most common cell type would be your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Platelets are actually just fragments of a cell, but we call these the formed elements of blood. There's proteins also in blood. There are soluble proteins um, such as fibrinogen, which precipitates or comes out of solution during blood clotting. It turns into fibrin. We have a whole unit on blood when we get to um, human anatomy 2, anatomy and physiology 2, that is. Blood also has other proteins. Albumin is an important protein. There's many other proteins that are found in the blood as well because blood transports materials throughout the body. So here's showing you blood red and white blood cells in a fluid matrix. We call that matrix plasma. Uh, the major um, function for blood is transportation. Uh, it transports the respiratory gases, transports oxygen to the cells and carbon dioxide away from the cells. It also transports nutrients to your living body cells, transports the waste away from them and other substances like protein, like hormones, etc. So we can see where do we find blood? It's within your blood vessels. These are the various types of blood cells which we will come to at a later unit. And Table 4.1 gives you a comparison. I'm not going to spend time with this. You have it in your book, and you can go through these on your own. A summary of connective tissue proper, with the various types cartilage, and then here's page two of that uh, table. You have bone tissue, and there's actually two types of bone tissue. We focus on bone tissue um, in uh, chapter six, and so we're going to be talking about compact bone and spongy bone later. Um, and here's blood, and again, blood has its own unit in chapter 17. Muscle tissue. There's Muscle tissue has a great blood supply. It's highly vascularized. Its function is for movement. There are three types of muscle tissue, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle. And this is a picture of skeletal muscle. I think this is the coolest looking um, tissue, actually. Um, so here are the muscle fibers going horizontally. And these little vertical stripes are actually um, a reflection of the orientation of, of little proteins within here. So you've got uh, long cylindrical multinucleate cells and obvious striations. Multinucleate, of course, refers to more than one nucleus because very early during embryonic development, 
many cells come together to form a muscle fiber. We still may call it, though, a muscle cell, but in reality, it, it, uh, as an adult, our muscle cells are multinucleated because they originally formed from several cells fusing together. A striation means a stripe, and you can definitely see these white, pink, white, pink stripes. And if you look at that um, very, very closely, which we will when we get to the muscle unit, um, it actually uh, indicates a very regular arrangement of the proteins that are the contractile proteins in your muscles. Uh, what do we do with skeletal muscle? It allows us to have voluntary movement, locomotion, manipulation of the environment, facial expression, and it is primarily under voluntary control. Where do we find it? Um, it's attaching bones uh, to the skin and also uh, attaches bones to muscles or muscles to bones. And so there's the electron, or excuse me, the, it's actually a compound microscope, um, approximately 440, 440X. Cardiac muscle, this is only found in the heart. It forms the heart muscle. Uh, the, the cells are branching. There are some striations or little stripes, but they're not real regular. Um, generally, you have one nucleus per cell. Um, and these cells actually will, like they call it interdigitate, they actually will uh, connect with one another at specialized junctions called intercalated disks. And this, when you see these intercalated disks, it's somewhat of a giveaway that this is cardiac muscle. To me, it, it reminds me kind of of bamboo when, when there's a, every once in a while you see a little um, connecting line between two regions. But um, cardiac muscle cells communicate a nerve impulse with one another so that each ch uh, chamber, in fact, the two lower chambers, well, first the two upper chambers, then the two lower chambers, need to contract as a unit. So it's really important that all of these cells contract at the same time. Um, what does it do? It allows blood to be pumped um, out from the heart um, to allow blood circulation, and it's found in the walls of the heart. Smooth muscle, this is kind of a, a strange looking stain. It's kind of greenish. We have smooth muscle uh, prepared slides that looks more pink. Um, and so it looks kind of more like this. These are spindle shaped cells. They have central nuclei that will be elongated, kind of more of a lavender color. You don't see striations at all. The cells are arranged closely to form sheets. What does it do? It propels substances or objects such as foodstuffs, urine, or a baby, along internal passageways. This, you do not have control of this. This is involuntary, so it happens without you even trying to concentrate on it. So where do we find it? Mostly in the walls of hollow organs. Nervous tissue, this um, is what the brain, spinal cord, and nerves are composed of. It regulates and controls body functions. The neuron is actually that main cell in nervous tissue. It transmits what we call nerve impulses, and we have a whole unit on the nervous system at the end of this semester. Um, and we will be talking about the neurons and nerve impulses, how these are transferred um, throughout the body. And then we have neuroglia. These are the support cells uh, that support the neurons. Um, neuroglia, there, there are several types of these. Sometimes we call them glial cells. And um, we will be getting to a further discussion of this again when we get to the nervous system. And here's the example of nervous tissue, uh, a slide that shows you the neuron. This is showing you um, neurons are branching cells. They have processes or things that stick out that might be quite long. They extend from the nucleus containing cell body. And this is where um, information is passed um, at the den dendrites. This is the receiving area. Dendrites actually increase surface area so that other neurons can, um, as they send messages, the cell can receive that message. 
um, our nerve impulse. And this is the cell body, and the axon is the transmitting process that would send uh, the signal. Neurons transmit electrical signals from sensory receptors and to effectors, which would be muscles and glands, which control their activity. And the supporting cells support and protect the neurons. We find these, this tissue in the brain, spinal cord, and the nerves. Now we're on part C, and I will do a different video for this. Have a wonderful day, and I will see you soon.